<laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to talk. And um, although I'm coming um, after two fantastic talks, I actually started um, in biochemistry. And bizarrely, I love um, molecular structure. But this is something very different. I wanted to, to focus on this topic because for my whole career I've, as, in, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I've been fascinated by the health and um, impact of child maltreatment. But I'm focusing on this particular topic today because it gave me a scientific, a big scientific surprise. And, and I enjoy that. I think it's, uh, it's something that really changed my clinical thinking. So I want to start with the obvious. Abuse and neglect, we know, causes psychiatric problems, right? Actually, in the psychiatric classification system, DSM-5, attachment disorders are the only two disorders that are specifically associated with maltreatment, in other words, abuse and neglect. And there are, there, there's dis disinhibited social engagement disorder, which is characterised by children who are over-friendly to quite an irritating and disturbing degree. And then reactive attachment disorder, which is characterized by a failure to seek and accept comfort. And that is really a developmental emergency because children need, young children need adults to help them with everything. So if they don't seek and accept comfort, then they are shutting out the important adults in their life. And then of course there's post-traumatic stress disorder, but post-traumatic stress disorder isn't specific to maltreatment because you, know, you can develop PTSD from a bus crash, for example. Or from realizing that we've got less than 950 days till our, we're going to become, become a snake <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to be light of that at all. Um, really important. But you may have already heard about the very seminal work of Felitti and colleagues. It's more than 20 years old now about the importance of adverse childhood experiences for lifespan health. And on the left of this um, very famous slide um, are the, the various types of abuse and neglect. And on the right, there are much more, some of these are much more common um, forms of household dysfunction. So mental illness, having a parent who's been incarcerated, um, even divorce. And what, hundreds of studies have shown is that there's a dose response relationship between the number of ACEs that a child experiences and both mental and physical health outcomes. So this wasn't a surprise, we've known this for, for years, that um, five or more ACEs were associated with a five-fold risk of developing depression. But this was um, a dose response relationship that really shook up the medical and scientific world, where it showed that seven or eight ACEs are associated with a more than threefold risk of heart disease. So, to put it crudely, the bigger the load the child is carrying, the bigger the risk. But we noticed clinically something even more intriguing, which was that people who've been maltreated and who had psychiatric problems tended to have particularly complex problems with a lot of overlap and impairment. And obviously that is caused by maltreatment, right? So the bigger the load, the bigger the risk. But actually, it's not that simple because not all people who've had a big ACE load do go on to develop problems. And there are many people out there who've experienced lots of terrible childhood experiences who are actually doing fine. So what else is going on? We also notice clinically that complex overlapping problems experienced by people who'd experienced maltreatment were often neurodevelopmental. So things like tension deficit, hyperactivity disorder, autism, intellectual disabilities, tick disorders. And we decided to investigate this in a large population twin study, actually the largest in the world. We we're very lucky to get access to this, the Child and Adolescent Twin Study of Sweden. Um, 13,000, more than 13,000 twins, 50-50 um, male and female. And we looked at the twins aged nine. 
And the, the, the CATS team had asked parents about symptoms of ADHD, autism, tick disorders, and intellectual disabilities. And we asked the question, are abused and neglected children at the age of nine more likely to have multiple neurodevelopmental problems compared to their non-maltreated peers? And the answer was yes, but it was an even more stark yes than I had imagined. So maltreatment children, maltreated children in the population are nearly 10 times as likely to have three or more neurodevelopmental problems compared to non-maltreated children. So I wasn't imagining that clinical complexity. And as many of you will know, there's a lot of focus now on multimorbidity. And what's becoming more and more obvious is that neurodevelopmental multimorbidity starts in childhood. But this was a twin study. So we went on to ask, does abuse and neglect cause this increased neurodevelopmental disorder load? And this time it's not the load of ACEs, it's the load of neurodevelopmental conditions. And I'm just gonna walk you through this because I have to say, I, well, it's quite complicated <laughs> we did it, but we used the co-twin control design. So within this huge population of twins, several hundred twins had experiences of maltreatment and each twin obviously has a co-twin. And some of these co-twins have been maltreated while their co-twin hasn't. So each one of these little boxes is one twin child. Um, if they're gray, they haven't been maltreated. And if they're red, they have experienced maltreatment. And I've often been asked, well, how is this possible that two twins can, you know, one can be maltreated and one can't, but there are many way, reasons why, you know, these may be twins where they were separated by divorce, um, all sorts of reasons, but uh, it's a very useful um, design. So let's just focus on the monozygotic, the identical twins for a moment. What you see here is that if you look at the, the, the twins who've experienced maltreatment, many of them have complex overlapping neurodevelopmental conditions. And when they are concordant for maltreatment, then the co-twin also tends to have a similar complexity. So the big question is, will these discordant twins also have a high degree of complexity, like the co-twins? Because if they don't, then we can be pretty confident that it's the maltreatment that's causing the neurodevelopmental complexity. But in fact, there was no significant difference in the complexity between those who'd been maltreated and those who hadn't. So the answer is no. And actually, what this study showed was that there seemed to be additional genetic factors that were causing both the abuse and neglect and the neurodevelopmental complexity, which I have to say was a real surprise to me because I had always assumed that abuse and neglect was the culprit. So we can't prove this from this design. We've got another study ongoing that we're looking, where we're looking at this, but could these additional genetic factors be neurodevelopmental conditions that run in the family? Because we know that these things run in the family. So abuse and neglect, does it cause psychiatric problems? Well, not always. And actually, could neurodevelopmental conditions cause abuse and neglect? Now, we don't know the answer. I, maybe. In, Four years we will with any luck. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? As a clinician, it's important for me to remember that parents might also have heritable problems with learning, impulse control, problems with language or social understanding. And actually, usually this isn't a problem. And it seems that, for example, parents who have autism often understand children with autism better. And the same with parents with ADHD, they're often a lot more tolerant of the chaos of children with ADHD. But we know, for example, that there are certain symptoms of neurodevelopmental conditions that can be risk factors. So, for example, losing your, your temper 
is usually a sign of impulsivity, which is a symptom of ADHD. And if parents and children have problems with Im impulse control and other problems like poverty that are making life stressful, then perhaps this could sometimes be a toxic mixture. And there's emerging evidence for this. I mean, it's really well known that children who are very hyperactive, for example, are perceived by their parents as much more stressful to look after. But the other side of the story is double jeopardy. And this is my colleague, Ruchi Kagadrani, and we came up with this idea literally on the back of a napkin in a, in a coffee bar. And we just finally got an editorial published about it. And our double jeopardy model um, really suggests that maltreatment and neurodevelopmental conditions interact. And if you think about children who've been abused and neglected are less likely to have good regulation of their emotions because they haven't had the kind of opportunity to plug in with parents in the way to help them with that. But then we know that children with problems like ADHD, autism, tic disorders and intellectual disabilities often also have problems regulating their emotions. So perhaps that double whammy of emotion dysregulation places you at double jeopardy of mental health problems. And actually we've got some evidence for this. So we found um, in a, a large population study that children who've, been exp who've experienced abuse and neglect and have neurodevelopmental conditions like ADHD or autism at age nine are at twice the risk of developing mania symptoms at the age of 15, and that's a sign of severe mental illness. So does it matter which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, yes and no. We do need to understand this better because if neurodevelopmental conditions do have an important role here, then treating neurodevelopmental conditions in parents could greatly reduce the incidence, the, the prevalence of child maltreatment in the population, and obviously that would be a helpful goal. But as a clinician, it's important to actually embrace the chicken and the egg, because if a child or an adult has a history of abuse and neglect or trauma, it's important for us to think about your developmental conditions and to think about trauma and stress-related disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder and attachment disorders. And keep an open mind about what might be going on and do a careful assessment that covers everything. And unfortunately, that's not what we tend to do. We tend to stop with what we find worth. So we must avoid jumping to conclusions and making an omelette, because if we do that, we might never actually work out what the key ingredients were. So I'll be interested in your thoughts. <laughs>